hide, but this is hard. This is Hart Mountain in Lake County that I was just talking about. It's a high prominence in a very remote part of southeastern Oregon. And uh, for the sake of this recording, I will go ahead and repeat the fact that Lake County, Oregon, where Hart Mountain is located, is one of the most remote places in the interior west. So much so that a county the size of Vermont has only 8,000 inhabitants and about 10 times as many horses and cattle as people, if not more. But Hart Mountain rises about 3,000 feet above the desert floor. And because of that elevation, Hart Mountain offers habitat types that are not found throughout that desert basin. And that includes extensive aspen groves, year-round streams with riparian corridors that are lush in willows and other vegetation, and even one pine forest. And mountain ranges like this throughout the Great Basin offer a, a chance for migrating songboard, songbirds to stop in and refuel. And they must be very attractive to songbirds because every year bird watchers go to Hart Mountain during late spring and early autumn and other mountain ranges in this region and always seem to find some kind of a vagrant species. So in, uh, on June 1st, 2012, Tim Blunt and I, Tim is the co-author of Birds of the Pacific Northwest. We were on a five-day bird photography expedition trying to shoot photos for that book. And we thought we would go up to Hart Mountain and see what we could find. Hart Mountain also happens to be a national wildlife refuge that was created to protect pronghorns. And it has a small US Fish and Wildlife Service headquarters area. And when we pulled into that headquarters area, we noticed all the shrubs were in bloom and there were hummingbirds buzzing around. We expected to see the normal species, which would be in that area, rufous hummingbirds and perhaps black-chinned hummingbirds. So we were extremely surprised when we got out of the vehicle and put our binoculars on these hummingbirds to find that instead of the normal species, we were looking at four different broad-tailed hummingbirds. The broad-tailed hummingbird is the common species of the central and southern Rockies, and it's very unusual in Oregon. Broad-tailed hummingbirds have a summer range that supposedly extends to the very southeasternmost corner of the state of Oregon, but actually finding one there would be nearly impossible. So the range map is actually just a little bit too, uh, too liberal in terms of the northern extent of the range. But that orange dot, is the right in the middle of that is where Hart Mountain is. So these birds were definitely out of their normal range and we couldn't believe our good fortune. And uh, as I began photographing these birds, I worked my way around the shrubbery and they were being pretty good photography subjects. But I started realizing that one of them was a little bit different. And as I continued to take photos, my mind really didn't want to accept what I knew to be true as I was looking through the lens. Because the one that was a little bit different, I could no longer deny the fact that I was looking at a ruby-throated hummingbird. Now the ruby-throated hummingbird, as you probably know, is the single species that dominates the entire eastern half of the continent. Ruby-throated hummingbirds should be found nowhere near the Pacific Northwest. And this turned out to be only the third record for a ruby-throated hummingbird in the state of Oregon. And how lucky were Tim and I to stumble not only upon a ruby-throated hummingbird on Hart Mountain in southeastern Oregon, but in the company of four broad-tailed hummingbirds. So that was the singular event. And if you look at the range map of a ruby-throated hummingbird, you can see how far off course this bird was. Of course, Early June is still the migratory time for these uh, high elevation and interior west species of hummingbirds. But this bird was way off course. And as I started pondering that, some haunting questions came to mind, such as, where did this bird come from? How did he get here so far off course? And where would he go from there? And how would his life turn out? And I was really haunted by those questions. And again, this was almost exactly 10 years ago that uh, I began 
looking into hummingbirds with a new enthusiasm and a new interest. And they sort of dominated my interest in birds ever since then. And ultimately, that uh, ruby-throated hummingbird on Hart Mountain on June 1st, 2012, led to this book called The Hummingbird Handbook. And my approach to this book was I wanted to make the book and the subject matter interesting to people like you and me, who are obviously hardcore bird watchers and interested in, in birding. But I also wanted it to be useful and interesting to the general public to uh, introduce a more broader audience to the fascination of these birds. As you know, here in the Pacific Northwest, on the west side of the Cascade Range, we have two local characters. We have our Anna's hummingbird, and we have the Rufus hummingbird. The Rufus hummingbird is arriving from its long winter vacation in Mexico right about now. My first male showed up on March 4th this year. And as of yesterday, I have two males and several females. I don't have an exact count. And I would bet that some of you will have Rufus hummingbirds any day if you don't have them already. The Rufus hummingbird is the long distance champion of migrating hummingbirds. These birds range as far north as Southeast Alaska, but they all spend their winters down in Mexico. That's a long migration for a bird that weighs a little over the weight of one US penny. Interestingly, there was a Rufus hummingbird female that was banded by a hummingbird bander in Florida one year. And later that spring, that same bird was recaptured by a bird bander in Southeast Alaska. The straight line distance was nearly 4,000 miles. Can you imagine that kind of a migration twice a year, 4,000 miles, and then returning that, re repeating that journey on the southward migration, again, for a bird that's about two inches long? Just incredible. They're the northernmost species of all the hummingbirds. When I say all the hummingbirds, there are more than 340 species of hummingbirds. The vast majority of them live in South America and Central America, but we have more than a dozen species that are found here in the continental United States. But of them all, this is the northernmost species. They also happen to be one of the most uh, pugnacious of all the hummingbirds. And for those of you who are lucky enough to have both Rufus and Anna's in your yards during the summer, you can no doubt attest to the fact that given the chance, a Rufus hummingbird will be the big boss of your yard. The Anna's hummingbird is our year rounder. But it didn't used to be. The Anna's hummingbird has undertaken one of the most remarkable range expansions in the ecological world. Anna's hummingbirds are originally native to the mountains of Southern California and Northern Baja. But starting before the middle of, of last century, they kind of had a little breakout. They decided they were going to uh, expand their range. So if you look at this map, you'll notice that the dark blue was the approximate range of Anna's hummingbirds in the 1940s. If you were to go even before that, the range would be down there in that first dark blue section. But as the decades passed, Anna's hummingbirds started showing up farther and farther north and farther and farther east. And the whole thing was driven by, guess what? Us, we the people. It turns out through two different studies, that have come out in, in recent years, that Anna's hummingbirds were simply riding the gravy train. And that's because as the West Coast population exponentially increased, the, the, the West Coast human population, we humans did what we humans do. We like to plant lots of colorful flowers. And as more and more people planted more and more flowers and cities continued to grow, these hummingbirds kept finding food sources that could draw them further and further outside their historical range. And then when we added the popularity of feeding sugar water to hummingbirds, their range continued to expand with this new luxury food source. And it's continuing to happen now. The range map that appears on Cornell University's website, which is also the one that's in the hummingbird handbook, shows what you would think might be the most current 
Anna's Hummingbird Range, but even this map is rapidly becoming dated. And that's because as of last year, it's confirmed that Anna's hummingbirds are now nesting in the Boise, Idaho area. And their range continues to stretch eastward along the Columbia Basin and, and into a northeastern Washington and further eastward in the desert southwest. It's all driven by humans. And in fact, one of the interesting, interesting things about Anna's hummingbirds being year round in western Idaho is that as with most of their range expansion, they are year round in human populated areas. The more people, the better chance that Anna's will, will pioneer that area because when we have lots of people, we have lots of flowers. When we have lots of people, we have lots of people feeding hummingbirds artificial sugar water. And that is a critical food source during the winter. If you're interested in, in looking at one of those studies that explains exactly how this happened, uh, write this title down, you can find this online. And it's really very interesting because for quite a long time, scientists were questioning whether the range expansion of the Anna's hummingbird was more to do with a warming climate or more to do with people. And it turns out it was all about people. The Anna's and the Rufus hummingbird are two of seven widespread Western species. Now bear in mind that the Anna's didn't used to be widespread, but it certainly is now. Those other species, include the two on the top there that are not found in Washington, the Costas and the Allens, but the Allens is found in extreme Southwest Oregon. And then of course we have the broad-tailed hummingbird I've talked about already, which is the hummingbird of the central and Southern Rockies. And then we have the two species that are best known on the other side of the Cascades. The Calliope hummingbird is the tiniest of our hummingbirds and is a mountain specialist. And the black chin hummingbird is a wide ranging hummingbird with a, with a very large uh, range map and is commonly found in a variety of environments from uh, desert canyons to uh, forested mountaintops. One thing about hummingbirds, enjoying them does not depend on being able to identify each one that you see. If, for example, you were in central Oregon somewhere and it was July and feeders or flowers were buzzing with hummingbirds, including lots of juveniles and lots of females, it would be difficult for anybody in that moment to distinguish some of the black chins from some of the rufous, from some of the calliopes. A good example of some of the identification challenges is with the adult male Allens and the mature male rufous. Now, in that place where, they, where their ranges overlap in southwestern Oregon and northern California, usually a rufous will have a mostly or all rust-colored back, and an Allens will have a mostly green back. But there's so much overlap that when you find a bird that has a lot of both, a lot of rufous and a lot of green on the back, the only way to distinguish between the two is by the notch on that tail feather. And that field mark is only good on mature males. In the range of overlap, it is actually impossible to differentiate between a female Allens and a female Rufus or between the juveniles. And even experts, when they're banding these birds, have difficulty distinguishing the species sometimes. But again, enjoying hummingbirds does not depend necessarily on being able to identify all of them. But that's kind of a hard sell for a, a group of bird watchers because we're notorious for wanting to know what we're looking at. Let's talk about a little bit of hummingbird trivia. One of the fun parts about researching the hummingbird handbook was digging into all the different fascinating facts and fictions about these birds. But as you know, they're fantastic flyers. The species we have flap their wings at 50 to 60 times per second, which explains why you can't see the wings flapping very often. They can hover in place even, even in, a, in a stiff breeze that's making the flowers blow and the limbs sway they can keep pace with the swaying flowers without any effort whatsoever. They're expert hoverers. The Anna's hummingbird was the subject of a flight study and turns out that it's probably the pound for pound fastest bird. All of these birds, all these hummingbirds that we have have their unique display flights, which are all fascinating, but, but all of which are high speed maneuvers and many of which include some odd squeaking sounds produced by the tail feathers. 
So their, their flying ability is nothing short of fascinating. And I think one of the things that endears them to us is that all of us who have hosted hummingbirds in our yards with flowers and, and or feeders have had those experiences where a hummingbird will suddenly appear right in front of your face and hover a foot from your eyeballs for a few seconds, or a hummingbird that will fly full speed past your face at, and cut it so close that it startles you. One thing about photographing hummingbirds is all of you who are bird photographers and have worked at photographing hummingbirds have photographs exactly like this. They are fast. Talk about gravy trains. There's another gravy train that's really fascinating about hummingbirds, and that is their relationship with the sapsucker woodpeckers. This study was first, or, or this fact was first discovered with ruby-throated hummingbirds in the east. It was, it turns out that yellow-bellied sapsuckers, which is the bird on the left, as you know, they drill holes in trees to make the sap run. Sap is a sugary substance and the hummingbirds take advantage of it. The hummingbirds will hover at sap wells, that's what a sapsucker's holes are called, sap wells, and lap up that, that uh, sugar source. It's interesting because if you overlay a range map of a yellow-bellied sapsucker with that of the ruby-throated hummingbird, you'll notice that, that uh, the ruby-throated hummingbird's range fits within the range of the yellow-bellied sapsucker. In addition, northern populations of yellow-bellied sapsuckers are migratory, but their spring northward migration from their winter range occurs earlier than the northward migration of the ruby-throated hummingbirds. So by leaving earlier, they unwittingly create that gravy train for incoming northbound ruby-throated hummingbirds in the spring at a time when many different flowers have yet to bloom. The same relationship holds true here in the West. I think you would all agree that we're very lucky to be west of the Cascades in the range of the red-breasted sapsucker, certainly one of our prettiest birds in my opinion. But the red-breasted sapsucker and our other Western sapsuckers, they do the same thing. They drill sap wells in trees and our Western hummingbird species take advantage of that. A study in Northern California even found rufous hummingbirds that were defending sapsucker wells from other hummingbirds. I found this one fascinating. I call it how to hire a bodyguard. A study in the, down in the Southwest on black-chinned hummingbirds found that within a certain radius of an active Cooper's hawk nest, black chin hummingbirds enjoyed substantial nesting success, meaning their babies tended to survive. But outside a certain radius, they had dismal nesting success because of predation by jays. Jays of all kinds are notorious nest robbers. They love to eat eggs, they love to eat baby birds. Hummingbirds are certainly among their victims. A Cooper's hawk, of course, as you know, is a bird killer, and a jay would make a wonderful meal for any Cooper's hawk that can catch one. But a hummingbird is just too tiny for a Cooper's hawk to mess with. So as it turns out, that active Cooper's hawk nest creates a zone of protection for those black-chinned hummingbirds. A lot of people don't realize that a hummingbird is essentially just a sugar-powered flycatcher. They need that sugar to fuel their high-speed lifestyle, but they need the fuel and other, or the, the protein and other uh, critical elements from meat. And that's what they do. They eat meat in the form of tiny bugs and other tiny creatures, which they traditionally typically catch on the wing. If you've ever seen a hummingbird in your yard that's sitting on a perch and flies up in the air four or five or six or 10 feet and then returns to its perch, what you've witnessed in high speed is a hummingbird snatching a tiny bug out of the air. And they do this hundreds of times a day. They use their bills like tiny spring-loaded chopsticks, just as this photo illustrates. And this is a photo by a fellow named Mike Martin, and it's, uh, it captured the moment perfectly. Also, hummingbirds are powerful pollinators. This juvenile Anna's has his bill buried into a red salvia flower to get at that nectar that's deep in the flower tube. The nectar is the sugar of life for hummingbirds. But along the way, it brushes its bill and its forehead against the outer part of that flower where the flower pollen is carried. 
and that yellow powdery substance on this bird's bill is flower pollen. So this bird will next go to another salvia plant, ideally, and when it inserts its bill to get after the nectar, it will deposit as well as collect pollen. So it's mixing up the pollen and thereby creating genetic diversity for the plant. And that's how hummingbirds are pollinators. They also tend to be curious and combative. One of the things about hummingbirds that really endears them to us is what we sometimes call a, a very serious case of curiousness. That's probably anthropomorphizing it a little bit, but hummingbirds are in fact curious. They're biologically programmed to be curious. And that's because they always have to be checking out potential new food sources, potential new territories, and potential rivals. I'm not sure that adequately explains their combativeness though. It's very interesting to, to watch hummingbirds and, and watch them a lot because you will notice that they don't only exact their revenge on members of their own tribe, but whatever bird they perceive to have wronged them can become the victim of their wrath. And I've watched hummingbirds chase all kinds of other birds away. Just last summer, uh, one of my cantankerous little rufous hummingbirds chased a black-headed grosbeak 100 yards down the trail behind my house. And for about a week, he also decided to make a song sparrow one of his little victims. And every time that poor song sparrow showed his head above the tall grass, he would be driven back into that tall grass by that rufous hummingbird. So they tend to uh, exact their belligerence on just about anybody, but that's part of the fun of watching hummingbirds is all their antics. Uh, and a lot of those antics uh, are sort of a, a, appear to be aggressive behavior. And when hummingbirds fight, they fight for real. They, they don't always make contact with one another, but they can damage one another. They can hurt one another. But it's all about defending territories. And in, in the case of feeding hummingbirds sugar water or planting flowers for them, we're creating a, a scenario in which they can create uh, territories for themselves. Now, territories shift a lot in the hummingbird world. One of your hummingbirds may hold sway in the front yard, another one in the backyard, but those kind of relationships can be shifting all day long or even all week long, or they can change a lot. But uh, the outcomes of these, these miniature fisticuffs are very difficult to discern sometimes because it all happens at such high speed. Last year, I went out one day just to feed, to fill my feeders. And I happened to notice right below one of the feeders on the ground was a uh, male anise hummingbird lying on his back. I assumed he was perished. So I picked him up and I was walking out from the carport and all of a sudden he just righted himself and flew away. I think he was probably the victim of, of a fight with one of his, his cohorts. But there's a lot of reasons that they are attractive to us. Their bejeweled, bejeweled plumage, warp speed lifestyle, engaging theatrics, and also their enigmatic nature. That's what makes them alluring to us. And the fact that they readily adapt to humans as neighbors, and that makes them irresistible to us. One way we can repay them is by being good hummingbird hosts. Number one rule in being a hummingbird host is do no harm. If you're going to feed artificial sugar water to hummingbirds, there's a set of rules that we must abide. Number one is keep them clean. Keep those feeders meticulously, fastidiously clean. When I was doing the research for the hummingbird handbook, I interviewed a number of wildlife rehabilitators. And they said the top reason why hummingbirds came into their facilities was because the birds were infected with black mold and could no longer feed themselves. That black mold comes from dirty hummingbird feeders. So it's critical that we don't do more harm in our desire to uh, appeal to these birds by feeding them sugar water that's tainted or turned in, in dirty feeders. So we have to keep the feeders meticulously clean. As far as the sugar water, four parts water and one part sugar, plain white sugar. Boil the water, take it off the heat, stir in the sugar, let it cool. You can keep it in a jug in the refrigerator for four or five days typically. How frequently you change the, the water in the feeders depends a great deal on the temperature outside. 
If you have feeders that are generally in the shade and it's this time of year, you can probably get away with three or four days or until they, they drink it dry. But come warm weather, as soon as the sun starts beating down and we get those 80 and 90 degree days, you may literally have to change that food every day and clean those feeders every day. It's a lot easier to keep the feeders clean than it is to have to work hard to clean them once they get soiled with that black mold. Remember, sugar water is going to ferment very quickly in warm weather. Don't add any red dyes. I think we all know that one by now. But also don't use organic sugar. Don't use molasses. Don't use honey. Refresh them frequently and also keep them out in the open. Keep your feeders in a place where when the hummingbirds are feeding, they have a full field of view to keep an eye out for potential predators. Be careful with cats. I don't hate cats. I actually own a cat. But I do recognize how significant of a factor they are in the decline of songbirds throughout the world. So it's important that we be careful with them. Cats are certainly able to capture hummingbirds, and they usually do it in places where hummingbird feeders and flowers are simply low enough to the ground or provide concealing places where cats can ambush from. So be careful with the cats. Did I mention keep them clean? I'm glad I did. About that sugar water. People often ask, you know, why, why can't we use brown sugar, raw sugar, organic sugar, honey, other sources like that. But Tucson Audubon Society describes it uh, pretty succinctly. And Tucson, of course, in, in Arizona is Hummingbird Central. We have a variety of hummingbird feeder styles we can choose from. There are two basic types. There's the saucer, saucer style feeder, such as has been popularized by a company called Humzinger. And these are great and they're popular because they're so easy. Take the lid off, fill the reservoir, put the lid back on, and you're done. Most of them have a built-in ant moat, which is a hollow section in the middle where the stem is. And you put a little water in that, and that prevents, generally prevents ants from being able to uh, climb down the, the pole and uh, climb into the holes and get into the, the sugar water. They also are naturally bee proof. And that's because the little ports where the hummingbirds feed from are too far above the level of the sugar water for, for bees to even reach so they don't bother with them. The other basic style of feeder is what we call the bottle style feeder. Most of them work by inversion. You have to turn them upside down to fill them and then put the feeder section back on and turn them right side up. You have to be a little careful doing so because it's easy to spill that sugar water. And during the summer, spilled sugar water attracts ants, bees, yellow jackets, that kind of thing. The other thing about bottle style feeders is they have more parts. So they require a little more diligence in the cleaning. It's important to take them apart and make sure there's no mold growing in those hidden places you can't see. And did I mention keep them clean? This is critical. Again, it's a lot easier to just keep them clean than to have to clean them once they get dirty. And it's certainly healthier for the hummingbirds. So again, when I did the research for the hummingbird handbook, I talked to a, a number of experts. And one of the, the questions I asked them is, what method of cleaning do you recommend? A little bit of bleach, like a 10% bleach solution, a little bit of detergent, a little mild detergent, maybe a little bit of vinegar, just hot water. They all came to the same conclusion, which was all those methods are fine. Whichever one you use, make sure that you rinse absolutely thoroughly so there's no residue left. No bleach residue, no vinegar residue, no detergent res re residue. So in addition to that, which, which, whatever method you use for cleaning, you also need a supply of either tiny brushes or pipe cleaners to, to clean those little holes and those little places that you can't see maybe on the bottle style feeders. One other thing that you can do is you can take them apart and run them through the dishwasher. The heat in the dishwasher will sterilize them. And uh, one, of the, one of the problems with that method is it tends to eventually wear down some of the plastics, but uh, that takes a long time. But the, bottle, the glass style feeders are great for just putting into the, uh, into the dishwasher. Now, of course, gardening for hummingbirds is probably the better choice anyway. 
Or maybe you'll want to do both, grow flowers and feed sugar water. Hummingbirds caused me to become a gardener. Well, hummingbirds and my taste for chili peppers, but mostly hummingbirds. And uh, I find gardening to be fascinating in that it sort of uh, puts me in direct contact with the ecosystem I'm trying to create and, and the one that, that I'm trying to maintain for the hummingbirds. Now, I'm lucky that I have a strip of land behind the house that I've been able to plant with hummingbird attracting flowers, and I call it Hummingbird Alley, as you can probably see why. A whole lot of great red flowers that hummingbirds love. But gardening for hummingbirds does not need to be particularly complicated. I use a lot of pots. On the left there, you see some columbines in a pot and some larkspurs in a pot behind that. I also had a little fringe along the barn that I thought could use a, a little dressing up. It was facing, the, it's a south facing sunny area. So I built a little cinder block enclosed garden. I'd read about doing cinder blocks because you can use the holes in the cinder blocks to grow things as well. So I established this little skirt garden along one edge of the barn and uh, planted some hummingbird favorites. And in the first year, everything did really well. I planted, actually planted some root vegetables and some flowers and some herbs in the holes in the cinder blocks. And uh, this, this spring right now will be at the garden's second year. And already some of the hummingbird favorites I've planted are looking great. So that's kind of a complicated way of doing things. But if you don't have that kind of space or that kind of time, certainly select some great plants that you can use in pots. And uh, you'll, you stand a good chance of attracting hummingbirds if you choose the right flowers. So what are those right flowers? There are a lot of great choices for hummingbird flowers. These birds feed on thousands of different types of flowers. But when you choose what to plant, think about the bloom time, meaning think early in the year and think late in the year. And also think about elevation in terms of high and low, how tall do these plants get? If you have limited space in a garden, for example, you can get more bang for the buck if you plant some tall flowering plants in the back and have a cascading effect down to some lower growing plants. So think about the geometry and also think about the seasonality. I maintain what I call in my head a top 10 of hummingbird favorite flowers. And that top 10 probably changes daily. Today, top 10, we'll start with a flower called Phygelius or Cape Fuchsia. This is not a true fuchsia. It's also a non-native, and I'm gonna talk more about native species in a moment, but it's a non-native that is cultivated for garden use and does not escape. I've grown these for years and I've never had one escape on its own and, and pioneer a new place. So they're very easy to maintain. They are beautiful flowers. They grow on tall spikes. And once the plant is established in its second or third year, it'll put out hundreds if not thousands of these flowers all year long and you can deadhead, deadhead them to get new growth very easily. Number nine on my list today is a, uh, a flower called cardinal flower. This, this is native to uh, the Eastern half of the country and then some, but what I love about cardinal flower is it's wonderful in pots, but more importantly, it's a late bloomer. It blooms, in, at least here and where I live in Salem, Oregon, it blooms in August and September. So it blooms at a time when a lot of the other flowers have faded. And one of the things about having anise hummingbirds where you and I live is we sort of have to think about year round because the birds are here year round. This is cardinal flower in its native habitat. They're just gorgeous flowers. And I, I put mine in pots because uh, they're, they're easy to grow in pots and they come back year after year. And any Northwest winter is just child's play for a, a cardinal flower. They're a, a species that's very hardy and well adapted to cold winters. The next on my list is called Liatris or blazing star. These are grown from bulbs or corms to be more exact, but they grow about four feet tall and they put up these beautiful pink flower heads. That the hummingbirds absolutely love. The leaves are, are long sword-like leaves, almost look like big blades of grass. I've grown these for years also. They're very easy to control. They're, a, a na they're native to North America. I even put some of the, the little corms in my uh, cinder bricks, thinking maybe I could uh, contain the plants because the parent plants can keep expanding. I had one one year that I, I planted and by its fourth year, the base of that clump was a foot in diameter. I ended up in the winter breaking it in half and replanting the other half elsewhere, but the cinder brick did its job. It contained the size of the parent plants and they put up these nice tall spikes that towered above the other flowers and the hummingbirds loved them. 
I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the penstemons. There are many different kinds, including some Northwest natives. I'm sure, I'm sure you've been up in the mountains or in, in Eastern Washington on the other side of the Cascades and seen some of the purple varieties that are absolutely beautiful, all of which attract hummingbirds as well as other pollinators like bees and butterflies. Uh, I like some of the red cultivars for the hummingbird garden. Uh, these are two that I grow. There's a, a native purple one on the left and this red firecracker penstemon on, on the right is one of my favorites. And they're a mid to late summer bloomer, at least where I am with this with this particular species. And the hummingbirds absolutely love them. I can deadhead them and get about a, a half size bloom for later in the summer. Columbine is one of my favorites because it's an early bloomer. Columbines bloom, depending on which columbine you're using, they tend to bloom from April into June. When I built the new garden, I just had to get at a nursery one day and I noticed they had these big purple and red columbines already starting to bloom and for sale as started plants. So I was very excited. I bought a bunch of them, figuring that was perfect to start my garden with. I put them in the ground, they did great, but I started realizing that the hummingbirds were more or less ignoring them. The bumblebees loved them, the butterflies loved them, but the, the hummingbirds were kind of ignoring them. But I have another columbine, a small pink variety, another cultivar that they love. And I started comparing these different columbines and I realized what the problem was. That big purple columbine, if you look at those spurs that trail off the back, those are called nectar spurs. And the nectar is held way down deep in those spurs. And I concluded that it's just too much trouble for the hummingbird to stick his long bill and long tongue all the way down in there to get at that nectar, just too much work. Even though they do have long bills and long tongues, I think that was just a little overkill for them. But that pink columbine on the right has short spurs and they readily can get to the, the nectar in this particular one and they, they love them. So that got me to thinking, what about our native Northwest columbine, the Western red columbine, Aquilegia formosa? I thought, why can't I grow that? It's common, I, I see it all the time up in the woods. I see it in, in uh, even in the desert in places where it's shaded from the sun and where there's maybe little springs. So it's, it's very common in the wild. So I found a source for seeds, the place that sells native seeds, and I sowed those seeds into pots and they became little baby columbines. And uh, this will be their second year. I've already transplanted them. They're already starting to, to put on a lot of new growth and I'm hopeful that they will all be blooming profusely this spring. Columbines are great for that early season bloom. So usually they're, they're going to be one of the first flowers that really takes off in my garden. And so they're great for uh, that April, May time frame. Even earlier, if you really want to accommodate Anna's hummingbirds in, in early spring and late winter, as well as the first arriving Rufus hummingbirds coming in from winter migrate or from winter wintering in Mexico, these are two natives that are great. The red flowering current is gorgeous, as you can see. It can grow to the size of like a small tree, but mostly it's a shrub. And it, it starts producing blooms right now uh, from uh, late February through March. Another one is the tall organ grape, Mahonia, and it's a, another spring, mid spring bloomer. So these are great choices uh, if you're really trying to create a yard where you can accommodate hummingbirds uh, throughout, the, throughout the year. No hummingbird can resist honeysuckles, and we have some native species that are great. One thing about honeysuckles, native versus non-native makes a lot of difference with the Lonicera genus. Our native honeysuckles are wonderful. They're, if you can find uh, plants or started plants, you can put them in pots and give them a trellis and they'll do great. But the non-native honeysuckles, many of them can be invasive, especially those that come from Asia and other parts of the world. So it's best to avoid them. I've even had, years ago, I had a Japanese honeysuckle and I had it in a pot, I thought it was safe, uh, but the pot turns out had a couple little drainage holes in the bottom. And when I saw a uh, Japanese honeysuckle growing up my fence about four feet away from that pot, I got suspicious and sure enough that thing had escaped down the hole in the pot through the ground under my walkway and started growing up the fence line. So yeah, they can be invasive. So it's best to stick to the native species. But again, hummingbirds cannot resist honeysuckle and they're wonderful summer bloomers. They'll bloom all summer long. I'm not sure you could really go wrong with a flower called hummingbird mint or Agastache. Agastache is another native genus. There's a, we have some Northwest natives, such as giant hyssop 
on the left there, but also a variety of, of types that are found in the, in the desert southwest, but have been uh, cultivated for garden use. And many of those are the orange and pink colors that I really like for hummingbirds, and they really like them. There's a variety of different colors. I use, again, I just use the orange and the pink colors. And one of the great things about hummingbird mint is it's pretty easy. It doesn't need water. Once it's established, it, it just wants a little bit of water. Doesn't need much, doesn't take much care. You can deadhead it if you want to. It really doesn't care if you deadhead it. It's gonna keep throwing up new spikes of blooms all summer long. And it's great because it starts blooming typically in June or July, and it'll continue blooming almost up until the first frost. This particular flower probably would be my number one always and everywhere if it was a little easier to grow in certain places. If you have a sunny location, maybe a south a south facing wall where a plant can get lots and lots of sun, hot lip salvia is a surefire bet for hummingbirds. They absolutely love it. It's one of the many different salvia species available, but this particular one was derived from a salvia native to Northern Mexico. And it's an interesting story how this one came about, but it's a wonderful flower for hummingbirds. Usually the flowers are this bicolored red and white. Occasionally they'll turn all white. Sometimes they'll turn all red, but usually the red and white is characteristic. If you want a background on this flower, it's kind of an interesting read. Just do a Google search for the truth about salvia hot lips. It's very fragrant like many of the salvias. And as my backyard plant can attest, it can get huge given the right circumstances. Those circumstances are lots of sun and as much heat as possible. And once it's established, don't water it very much. We, I'm sure we all appreciate plants that don't need much water and this is one of them. And uh, this plant at this stage is only three years old. So it's done really, really well in this really sunny location that gets plenty of heat. Just needs good drainage, not much water, lots of heat. So if you have a spot, or if you have a place you can put a pot, this uh, salvia hot lips does well in ground or in a pot. So that leaves us with, oh, I'm sorry, there are, again, I mentioned there are a variety of other salvia, a couple Northwest natives, but the most uh, best known of which is the purple sage, salvia dorii, found in, uh, in uh, dry, arid landscapes east of the Cascades, but not an easy plant to grow because of its, its native environments. It, it's kind of a xeric plant. But there's lots of uh, cultivars and species of salvia. Many of them are just are great for hummingbirds, do well in our climate, especially if you give them plenty of sun and not a lot of water once they're established. You can prune them back in the winter, they'll come springing back the next spring and summer. All right, so that was number two. What's my number one? Almost, uh, almost always I come to good old bee balm as my number one choice for hummingbird bliss. And that's because even I can't seem to kill bee balm or monarda. A lot of you are probably familiar with this flower. It can grow about four feet tall on these long green stalks with these beautiful leaves and these wonderful red flower heads on top. And if you don't think that hummingbirds absolutely go crazy for this, check out this photo. They love monarda. I can't grow it fast enough. But uh, luckily, it's pretty easy to grow. I, I do mine. You can plant it from seeds. I've always done mine from started plants that I get at the local nursery. And once this plant gets established, you really don't need to do much other than give it a little bit of water, not too much, give it plenty of sunshine. It will bloom all summer long and up to the first frost. You can create these beautiful sweeps of flowers with Monarda. <clears throat> There's a couple species. Monarda didyma is the red one, the bright red one that I use, <clears throat> that I use mostly anyways. Uh, and really the only thing you need to do other than give it lots of sun, don't water it too much, is thin them occasionally so that there's plenty of air circulation among the stalks because they can grow quite dense and uh, they can be subject to a little bit of, of powdery mold if they don't get enough air circulation. So just thin them a little bit as needed. The other one is Monarda fistulosa. And I might, I might add that Monarda is a, a native to North America. And uh, some of the, the fistulosa cultivars range from, from almost white to a deep purple. And uh, they're just wonderful flowers for all pollinators. Butterflies love them, bees love them, and hummingbirds adore them. When I start my Monardas, they can get a little scraggly in the first year. So what I do is I take big tomato cages and I cut the backside off so I can open them up. And then I contain each plant within one of those. 
By the second year, Monarda will start to spread like this. And uh, this, is, this is a winter shot. And it'll create these mats. And when it starts growing the second year and thereafter, they'll grow straight and tall. And you won't have to contain them in the, uh, in the tomato cages. So I said I would get back to the idea of native species. There's a big difference oftentimes between non-native and invasive and then noxious. So those are distinctions that I think are important, especially when it comes to the Anna's hummingbird, which we have here year round. The Anna's hummingbird, quite frankly, is also an invasive. This is not its natural range. If not for human beings, it wouldn't be here. It wouldn't be in the Northwest. We did this. We created this opportunity for the Anna's hummingbird to expand its range. And that's why for certain non-native species of plants, I'm not too hardcore about avoiding them. There's one called the purple dead nettle. I bet a lot of you have seen this around your yard, especially right now. It blooms January, February, March, April, May, even as early as December. It grows a few inches tall, at most maybe a foot tall in perfect conditions. But a few years ago, in February, I got lucky one day. I walked outside. I was actually just going out to throw some, some bird seed out. And I saw a Anna's hummingbird hovering three inches off the ground, feeding at these flowers. So then I started paying attention. And I realized that purple dead nettle, at least in my yard, is a very important winter food source for Anna's hummingbirds. So I decided to check on it. I checked with the Oregon Department of Agriculture. They said, yeah, it's non-native, but it's also not a noxious species. It's not noxious, meaning it's not going to overwhelm and damage ecologies. So that once I learned that, I realized, you know, I'm going to let them be. I'm going to let these purple dead nettles grow where they grow in my yard so that the Anna's hummingbirds have that as a food source. Non-native Anna's hummingbird feeding on non-native purple dead nettle. But non-natives, they're sort of a hierarchy. Let's go to the middle of that, that hierarchy with the jewelweed, Impatiens campensis. Beautiful flowers. They grow in moist areas. They bloom in late summer and early fall, and hummingbirds absolutely adore them. As it turns out, this particular impatient species is non-native to the Pacific Northwest. And we do have two or three different native impatient species. In some places, Impatience campensis can crowd out native ecosystems if it grows dense enough, and that does happen in some places. So it's a plant we probably should not encourage. I have them growing in my yard and by no fault of mine. They just happen to be invasive here. And each summer, I grapple with whether to remove them all or let them be for the hummingbirds. So I decided for a middle ground. I control them. They're very easy to pull out of the ground. I've made sure they don't spread beyond the confines of the, the wet slope under the trees behind my backyard. So I just watch them carefully and control them. But 200 yards down the trail behind my house into the woods owned by the adjacent landowner, there's huge sweeps of these that grow under the shade of these trees in a wet area. And they clearly have crowded out native species. So in that case, uh, with the permission of the landowner, I decided just to remove them. And I did that. It was interesting because a variety of native species were able to come back after I did that. At the far end of the uh, invasive category are plants we really want nothing to do with. The uh, well-known butterfly bush on the lower right there. A lot of you are probably familiar with that because if you go back 20 or 30 years, these were common landscaping plants, very popular because of those beautiful purple flowers. Well, it turns out they're highly invasive and difficult to control and difficult to get rid of once they're established, so much so that here in Oregon, at least, selling them is, is now against the law. They've uh, taken over certain ecosystems in places in Oregon that uh, they really created quite a battle for people that have to uh, recover native ecosystems. And that's a, the, the, the butterfly bush is, is a plant, plant that's not native to North America. But even some plants that are native to North America can be highly invasive if given a chance. On the upper left is the well-known trumpet flower vine of the, the southern of the southern states. It's an absolutely beautiful vine, produces these incredible three-inch long flowers. Hummingbirds go nuts for this plant, but it can be very difficult to control, especially if it does get some egress and, and makes a successful escape. 
So this particular plant may be a wonderful hummingbird plant, but it's probably best to avoid it. Even if you wanted to put it in a large pot, you have to be awfully careful it doesn't escape. So that's my take. I, I'm, I'm fully behind the native flower movement when it comes to, to gardening for birds and hummingbirds and other pollinators. But I also have an asterisk to that particular concept in that there are certain species that I will use and tolerate for the good of our invasive and non-native Anna's hummingbird. There are other things you can do to help create a hummingbird friendly yard. That includes some open spaces, some prominent places that birds can perch. Hummingbirds love to have perches where they can survey their territory and where they can do their insect hunting. If they have a water source, that's wonderful as well. If you have a, a bird bath, you can, you can sort of outfit it to make it hummingbird friendly by placing some stones or other objects in it for a shallow, a so-called shallow end. Sometimes, in fact, if you, uh, I bet a lot of you have the experience where you're out watering your garden with the hose and a hummingbird kind of flies through for a, a little shower. And uh, so yeah, hummingbirds definitely can be attracted to water and you can actually buy hoses that you can put on a, a what they're called a mist hose and you can buy a timer for them. So if you really wanna have some fun in the summer, get a mist hose, put it on a timer so that it, it starts misting at the same time every afternoon. And uh, pretty soon the hummingbirds will adapt to that and you can sort of, uh, like clockwork, go out and watch the hummingbirds take their little mist shower. There's a lot of good resources online, including the Audubon Society's own uh, Hummingbirds at Home page. And there's a lot of great suggestions there on how to create a hummingbird friendly yard. One thing you, th that we don't talk about very often about creating a hummingbird friendly yard is that attracting hummingbirds to your yard is a competitive endeavor. It's practically a sport in this country. And if you don't do as good a job or a better job than your neighbor down the block, you may come out with no hummingbirds. So you have to be good at it, especially in, uh, in urban settings where you have some competition. And believe me, you'll have competition. When I was working on the hummingbird handbook, I started paying attention everywhere I was driving around. And I realized there are a lot of people with hummingbird feeders and hummingbird flowers. It really hit home one day when I was in downtown Salem, Oregon, amongst all the, in, all the, the commercial buildings. And I parked on the street and I just happened to look up down an alley. And there's a restaurant that has two levels above it. And the upper level must be some apartments. And from a tiny patio hanging over nothing but an alley, there was a hummingbird feeder. So clearly the, whoever lived in that apartment was having success attracting hummingbirds into that alley. So they're, they're very uh, accommodating if you give them the resources that they need. But remember, it's a competitive endeavor. So a mixture of feeders and great flowers that bloom throughout the year, some open space, some water, some great perches, you have stand a very good chance of attracting hummingbirds to your yard. You do all that and sometimes the hummingbirds pull a disappearing act. I bet a lot of you had this experience where some particular day you realize, where did my hummingbirds go? Well, of course, let's rule out the, the shoulder seasons when, the, when they're migrating, but that can, this can happen during, during the prime season, you know, of when the rufous are already here and you've got the annas from March through August. You can almost always chalk it up to natural cycles. Usually something has come into bloom somewhere that they prefer or that they want to take advantage of, or you're in that season when the hummingbird, the female hummingbirds are busy with nesting duties. Only females partake in building nests and raising young. The males have nothing to do with it. So the females become extremely busy during the nesting season and you may not see them near, nearly as often as before and after the nesting season. So usually you can track, you can always chalk these sudden disappearing acts up to natural cycles. And quite frankly, one of those natural cycles is the competitiveness of hummingbird feeding these days. So maybe somebody down the block's doing a better job. Well, let's talk about hummingbirds on the road real briefly. I mentioned there are more than 340 species of hummingbirds. And the farther south you go, the more you find. So when you go down to the desert southwest, you have a handful of hummingbirds that are only found there. I like to call them the Arizona specialties. And there's about five different species that are only found in southernmost Arizona. So much so that there are certain hot spots like Patagonia, Arizona, and uh, Sierra Vista, Arizona, and certain properties in those places that cater to these hummingbirds. And this has created a, a, a little 
subculture of ecotourism where people come from all over to visit those places just to see these hummingbirds. So if you're really interested in seeing six or seven or eight species of hummingbirds in one place at one time, uh, look into traveling down to southernmost Arizona to these hummingbird hotspots. Of course, as birders who love seeing birds, you're going to see a lot more than just hummingbirds, but these are certainly one of the big draws. If we go a little farther south across the Mexican border and down into Central America, the diversity just continues to increase. Mexico and Central America are home to many dozens of species of hummingbirds. And uh, the, farther, the farther south you go, the more the diversity increases, the more the species count increases, and the more the bizarro world increases. When we get down into South America, we have all these incredible hummingbirds that are found occupying every imaginable habitat type from sea level all the way up high into the Andes Mountains. And throughout uh, many of the countries in South America and Central America, there's a, a very lively ecotourism based largely on hummingbirds as well as other birds, but hummingbirds are certainly one of the specialties. To me, hummingbirds are, are little rock stars. One of the things I really appreciate about them and learned about them during the research for this book is that they have this special power. They have this, they're like miniature ambassadors that have this power to usher people into the, the world of ecology. They can inspire us to be curious about the natural world around us. And what's really fascinating is, I'm sure a lot of you have had this same experience. You have friends maybe, or, or relatives that are not particularly interested in birds like you are, but they're fascinated by hummingbirds. And that's a special power. It's a, it's a power that these birds have to, to usher us into their world because they are so fascinating. And to me, that's important because I often ask, who will be our future conservationists? Our future conservationists are going to be people who are motivated. They're going to be the children of today who become inspired by something, become inspired by something that wants them to get involved in the world of ecology. And hummingbirds are one of those little portals, little rock stars that can help them do that. Thank you, everybody. I think we have a uh, question and answer session coming up now. Great, John. That was an amazing presentation. We definitely appreciate you, you providing it. There. There's a, a couple of questions in the um, chat. Once again, if you're interested in asking a question, you can uh, put it in the chat or um, turn on your video and raise your hand. So one of the questions that uh, came up first here was, uh, I'm just going to paraphrase, it was a little long, but um, you know, you definitely talked about the Anna's hummingbird, and uh, during you know the the cold snap, um, this person took their feeders indoors, and when they put them out, uh, the hummingbirds would buzz around their face, um, and that happened you know often. And they're wondering if that's an aggressive behavior or a friendly behavior. Well, it's hard to to put human emotion onto bird behavior, but what's going on there is hummingbirds have incredible sight fidelity they will remember food sources from one year to the next. Uh, so when you put out a feeder for them and they find that feeder and start using it, they're going to remember that. And if they have actually seen you carrying feeders back and forth, I'm convinced that they recognize that behavior. They sort of recognize that the food's coming. So they have this incredible sight fidelity. I, I heard a story once from a fellow who, uh, when I was working on this book, he had put up a hummingbird feeder one year, a, a disc style feeder. And one Rufus hummingbird was his, his uh, lone hummingbird for the entire summer. So he took that feeder down and didn't, he didn't realize that Rufus hummingbirds come back to the Northwest in March. So when March rolled around, all of a sudden a Rufus hummingbird showed up and the shepherd's hook on which he had hung that feeder, the hummingbird went to that shepherd's hook and started flying a eight inch circle around what would have been the disc of that feeder. So immediately he put his feeder back out. So they have great sight fidelity. All right. Uh, so Hillary was wondering why it's important to boil the water. Great question, Hillary. So boiling is the best way to kill pathogens. We don't really know what's necessarily what's in our water. Um, and water varies from place to place. But remember that a hummingbird weighs about a penny and a half. So it doesn't take much of a pathogen to potentially be very damaging to a hummingbird. So boiling is the best way to, to kill the pathogens. 
And Nancy's asking, what is a typical range for an individual Anna's hummingbird? Another great, great question. Hummingbird ranges vary considerably based on the available resources. And while it's hard to put exact numbers on it, uh, just uh, from observation in my own area here, I've seen Anna's hummingbirds that seem to try to establish a territory that's half of my yard. And I've seen Anna's hummingbirds that seem content with establishing a territory that's just one corner of the yard. But then I hike down my little trail through the, the other landowner's property and I find a male hummingbird, a male Anna's that seems to have taken over an entire 50 yard strip of that trail. So fairly significant territory. And in some species of hummingbirds, when you get into really uh, dense jungle, for example, down in Central America, their territories can be pretty small. So it, it's, there's considerable range. Wes is asking what and how do mother hummingbirds feed their babies? Great question. So the, the babies need the same nourishment that the adults get, a mix of, of sugar water, but also they need lots of bugs, lots of protein, lots of those building blocks. So female hummingbirds go out and feed extensively on, on small creatures as well as sugar water, and then they regurgitate that and feed it to their babies. And interestingly enough, once a, once a baby hummingbird fledges, once it makes its first flight and it's out of the nest, it is on its own. And so there's lots of uh, thank yous from Bonnie and Judy uh, and Jean and Sandy asked, um, is it beneficial to increase the mix uh, to three to one during cold weather? Great question. I get that question often. Generally speaking, you don't have to do that because that, that four to one mixture is sort of replicates the average sugar content in nectar, in flower nectar, but there's a great range of, of sugar content in flower nectars as well. So increasing that mixture to make it richer during the winter is something a lot of people do, but based on most of the experts I talk to, it's not necessary. As long as you maintain that four to one, you're probably fine. And you certainly don't wanna be any richer than three to one because too much sugar, you can start risking dehydrating your hummingbirds. Well, that's all the questions right now in the chat. Um, I'm not sure if anyone on on the screen would like to um, turn the video and, and uh, unmute. You could ask a question. Yeah, I've got an outdoor uh, barbecue. And the hummingbirds year round, not just in the summer, will go in and, and pick the ash out of it. I don't know whether you're looking for minerals or. I or... wonder. Isn't that interesting? but it's it occurs year round it's not i thought for a while they were using it to build the nest but i think you're looking for mineral content i have never heard that before that's fascinating now see now you you're going to make me go start digging into stuff again <laughs> <laughs> interesting can anybody hear this me is, this is christina um thank you for a great talk and um Similar to what the previous speaker mentioned, we've seen that in our um, Weber grill basin as well. Um, Very interesting. Yeah, it's not not a frequent occurrence, but it but it is has been witnessed many times over the years. I'll be darned, huh? Can anybody see me or hear me? So we can hear you. Okay, is there any way of augmenting the protein? We feed the hummingbirds. Catching a little fly so many times seems like a lot of work and a lot of energy. You know, that's a great question. And one of the recent things that's happened is people have started advocating for, for leaving uh, rotting bananas outside. And there's even one company that's making a like a little platform tray, sort of a container for rotted bananas, the, the idea being to create hatches of fruit flies. So it's really hard for me to judge whether that's a good idea or not. I mean, how much of an artificial ecosystem should we be involved in in creating? So I don't know, you know, in terms of the ethics of that, I'm not sure. But certainly doing that's going to create the size and type of food the, source that hummingbirds. Sugar feeders get full of little teeny gnats. I'm okay, uh, sorry, we had an overlapping question there. The uh, Scott, was that a uh, enough of an answer? Yes, it was, and, and the lady may be uh, giving us an answer. Yeah, so hummingbird feeders, especially the saucer style feeders, they do tend to attract little gnats, especially this time of year. And the gnats will get into that sugar water. One of the problems when, 
when bugs get into your sugar water, the bugs themselves will start to decay because they're, you know, you're adding different proteins and things to the water and that'll cause that sugar water to, to turn and ferment even, even more quickly. So it's important to not let the bugs accumulate in the sugar water, but any of those gnats that are flying around that bird feeder are certainly going to be open season for hummingbirds. And hummingbirds will also, you've probably seen hummingbirds flying around the, the eaves of your house and your screen windows and things like that. They'll, they'll hunt bugs in all kinds of places. So Mark is asking, uh, you know, well, he said, first, thanks for your presentation, but I was wondering where we could purchase your book. And I know we, we did put a link to your website there, but if, is there a specific spot where um, someone could purchase your book? I, uh, yeah, I have three answers to that. Um, first, I'm a huge fan of independent bookstores because we don't have many of them left, quite frankly. But um, I know like uh, University Bookstore in Seattle sells them, but I'm sure a lot of other people do too. Of course, you can get it from Amazon. I can, I, I have, I can sell signed copies myself. Uh, it's a $25 book plus $8 for um, priority postage. And you just have to send me a check, but I'm happy to sell signed copies if you want. Um, and probably the best way to contact me is, is via my email address, which is jshuey1 at gmail.com. Yeah. Having said all that, believe me, I do love it when people support their local independent bookstore. Gene, do you have a question? Yeah, I would just wanted to uh, quote uh, Connie Seidels, who was uh, one, one of our favorite presenters. And she said that if people knew uh, how feisty uh, hummingbirds were, they would adopt them as football uh, mascots. So <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Absolutely. If, if people only knew. <laughs> uh, they, the fact that they're so combative is what makes them part of what makes them so entertaining. <laughs> Willing to take a question that doesn't involve uh, hummingbirds. I'll do my best. Can you see this? Can you hold it up uh, in front of your face? I'm seeing uh, your yeah. your background. Oh, I'm not sure. Maybe you better hold off to the left of your face. I'm only seeing your dog background. Yeah, it's hard to do that unless you have yeah. your um, your background off. It's not going to work. Uh, Sorry. OK. I, I, th I think it's a part albino something. Oh. And it uh, visits us very frequently, regularly. And if someone wants to make an appointment to come and spend a day and watch out our window, uh, you might even see it. It's always fascinating when we get, you know, the albinos and the leucocystic birds. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, Rosemary was wondering if you could share your website again and. Um, it is located on our uh, Kitsap Audubon website. Okay, yeah, so. it's, it's uh, birdingorgan.com. <coughs> but uh, to contact me, it's better to use the Gmail account email that I gave you, which is, again, jshuey1 at gmail.com. Uh, Mike, a matter of question related to this, I've got to go, but uh, the Great Salt Lake bird festival is coming up uh in may and the events uh tickets go on sale next next to or yeah next tuesday uh people that might they're thinking about doing some birding festivals it's a great birding festival uh i've done it now for the last three years and they they put on some great tours and you get up and see some hummingbirds particularly in the in-town visits so Anyway, you might pass that around to everybody that's interested. That might might be thinking about a bird tour that's reasonably close. Thanks, Ray. Um, also, just want to mention that uh, Kim said she found your your book on the at the library, so that's all. Oh, good. It's spot yeah. for it. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Um, I, I had a quick question or maybe just a comment. One of the plants that I see them uh, used the most in my yard, which is a native, is a twinberry. They love twinberry. Yeah. And it's a great early season plant as well. Yeah. I might add, you know, this time we have uh, 
two or three more nights of sub freezing coming down here where I'm at. And one thing I always try to remind people is hummingbirds in cold climates, they need to feed very early, right when they come out of torpor for the night, and they need to fuel up very late. So whatever your strategy for sub freezing weather is with your feeders, whether you have a feeder heat, feeder heaters are great because you don't have to worry about it. But if you don't have a feeder heater, my strategy is to bring them in for the night and then put them back out in the morning. But the important point there is I bring them in well after dark because there's always that feeding binge right at last light, well after sunset. And then I get them back out about 30 minutes before the sunrise. So this morning, my hummingbirds, I, I kept track. I put the feeders out at 5.45 a.m. and the first hummingbird showed up at 6.08 a.m. So remember to get those feeders back out early. Yeah, mine, mine show up before dawn. <laughs> yep. They are tough little buggers, aren't they? Yeah. Oh, they are. <laughs> I have a quick question. Sure, Bonnie. Um, why do some hummingbird feeders uh, seem to have a, a, a wide grouping of hummingbirds around them where they all feed and are happy? Oh. Um, and they all get along, like there may be 10, 12, 15 all at once. And then some feeders, um, and I've noticed this, you know, like just figured in our yard, we have one in the front and one in the back, and we only get two or three, and, and usually it's the family of those. Is there any reason? For well, that? yes, partially yes. So oftentimes one male and even sometimes one female will just flat out dominate one feeder. And that can go on all day, all season with one individual hummingbird or that feeder domination can sort of switch from one hummingbird to another during the course of the day or a following day. But the other thing that happens, and, and I found this very fascinating because I'm not sure the reason for it. I'll give you an example from my own yard. I have a carport that's open on both ends. And underneath that carport, I have three hummingbird feeders hanging. It's great because it gets the hummingbirds and the feeders out of the rain, out of the weather. They love it under there. In the evenings, when they have that last big feed, when they all kind of come to, to peace with one another for a while, I have one of the, the saucer feeders has four holes in it. And then I have a large saucer feeder with eight holes in it. So one night, I had, when, when we had the first night of the freeze, we had an ice storm down here last year, a year ago. And the first night of that ice storm, the four hole feeder had 11 hummingbirds on it at most and six at minimum for that last feed in the evening. Wow. The eight wow. hole feeder had one male and he wouldn't let anybody else feed even in the evening. So I thought, I thought, okay, I'll fix this problem. I'll just switch the position of those hummingbird feeders. I'll put the eight hole feeder over here where the four hole is. And I'll put the four hole over where he wants to dominate his little territory. Well, guess what happened? He switched with it. <laughs> they're, they're nothing if not belligerent, but uh, you, you typically that that kind of feeder dominance is just you know one one dominant male or even sometimes a dominant female and again the the dominance can change from from moment to moment or from day to day or week to week and then of course when when you introduce new birds when the when the rufus arrive in the spring everything gets mixed up and they have to reestablish their territories mm -hmm. and then when the young come out of the nest everything gets mixed up again and they have to reestablish okay. their territories again Great, thank you, and wonderful presentation. Loved it. Thank you. Hey, John. Hey, Vic. Yeah. Um. When when would you expect the Rufus to head head back south? Great question. So a little bit depends on your location, of course. The farther north you are, the sooner it'll happen. So if I can give you my yard. My males always leave early in July. My my mature males. My females. And juveniles will the, the last of them will leave in early September. So the the, the mature males leave first. Okay. Uh, and I, you can probably back that up a few days, you know, up in northern Washington. All right. Well, terrific. Well, John, I, I, I do hope your experience here has gone well because uh, I'll be I'll be back talking to you. <laughs> well, it's great. You know, I mean, one of the things, Vic, about an audience like yours is every question is so intelligent. You know, so it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah. 
Ah, nice. All right. Well, we definitely appreciate you coming, John, and we appreciate everyone um, attending tonight. Uh, I think it was a really great presentation. Had about 55 people on the Zoom at least, uh, you know, signed in. It was probably many people who had, um, you know, someone else with them. So uh, definitely yeah. a great, uh, great opportunity. So thank you for everything, Mike, and thanks thank you everyone for attending. All right. Have a great night. Great. Appreciate weekend. it. Take Superb care. Presentation. Thank you.